Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. So I'm taking off my comparing hat for the next 40 minutes, and I'm putting my moderator one on. Uh, and we're going to talk today about keeping influence real. Um, I'm very lucky to be joined by three incredible ladies who see this topic from very, very diverse points of view. Um, first, we have uh, Kate Bones, who is best known for her beautiful 3D GIF portraits of musicians, performers, and the many colorful characters of <coughs> London's East End. Uh, Alice Chia, who is a producer at Social Pictures, which is part of a larger photography agency, um, and Social Pictures deals uh, with social content artists, so she can give us that point of view. And then finally, we have uh, Sarah Tasker, who is a photographer, writer, and creative coach who says that Instagram changed her life. So let's start. Um, so I'm really just excited to hear firstly how you think Instagram changed your life. It absolutely did, <laughs> unequivocally did. So I was working for the NHS and um, I, I was doing creative things in my spare time, but certainly not making a career of it, but started to share a photograph a day and really quickly grew this really loyal, engaged following that just kept growing and growing. And from there, it was, I mean, this was four years ago, so the concept of influence marketing was really in its infancy. Yeah. Um, but it became a business and it's now come to the point where four years on, it's my full-time job, my husband's quit his job and he works for the business as well. Um, and it's taken me all over the world and it's, it's kind of made all my creative dreams come true. Oh, that's, <laughs> a, nice, that's a nice story about yeah. Instagram changing your life. Do, Alice, do you, yeah. is that quite um, a common story that you hear from the people <laughs> that you work with that it's kind of happened organically? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that most, is sort of most true to say in this area is that there's a real mix so we will work with sort of artists who, you know, started before the whole Instagram phenomenon and were sort of creators, photographers, animators, whatever it might be, and then started posting on social platforms and it grew sort of secondary to what they do, but then became intertwined. And then we work with people who almost do it alongside other things. So someone who, I mean, who might be a mum and works full time, but then they have a very successful blog writing about that sort of thing and they happen to have a huge following so it's it's a real mix of how people end up doing it yeah, <laughs> yeah. and I think it's also um, it's it's really interesting about how people talk about what they do so Kate we were just running through the questions beforehand and you know you spoke about the fact that you you don't consider yourself as an influencer you consider yourself as as a maker um, how, do you think that that um, the way that other people box you in as an influencer, it, do, how do you find that in, on a working basis in terms of how people might come to you and want to work with you? Because you've done lots of brand work. Yeah. Do you find that a bit frustrating? Or I think it's been important for me to carry on documenting the way I do, so when I go out or people I've met and worked with, because, say, for instance, working with the drag scene and the queer community in East London actually, I think, gave me my style of work. And it's been really important to stay connected to them. And it also gives me an opportunity to experiment because working with brands, they take the, a, a line that I get a lot is that, can we have the same but different? Mm. And it's kind of, I kind of want to, as a maker, I want to make new things. And that's been something that I've struggled with, but I kind of accept now. But yeah. that's why it's good to keep keep close to them and try new things. Yeah, so staying true to what you do, not what people are asking you to do. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I, and I think that's probably the, the case with a lot of things, but it seems like there's a real focus from an influencer perspective on this balance of marrying together what you want to do with what a brand is asking you to do. Do you, do you have any experience of that where it's kind of been a bit of a challenge trying to marry those two things? There's always a push and pull. Um, and I think good influencers will push back. We'll push back on a brief and we'll push back to a brand because we know our audiences. And, and obviously, from a brand perspective, from a PR perspective, of course you know what you want out of a campaign and you know what works for your brand. But we are the ones kind of on the front line with our audiences day in, day out, talking to them, communicating with them, selling to them. 
Um, so I sell my own digital products to my audience as well. So I, I mean, I, I have hands-on experience. I've made over two hundred thousand pounds of sales just this year to my audience. So when a brand comes to me and wants a really specific type of campaign, it can be frustrating for me to have to try and communicate why I think that's going to alienate people, why it won't be as successful as it could be, um, because from their perspective, they can often kind of dismiss you as, oh, she's just a blogger, and, and they don't understand the level of uh, understanding and expertise that goes into it. Yeah, so you must have quite a, an in-depth knowledge of all of the myriad of challenges that comes with promoting products via an influencer marketing channel, which is, by all means, you know, just social and digital channels. Is that, um, what's, what's your take on that at the moment? Is it difficult? Because, you know, I say I think it's complicated from a brand perspective, but what about from a, an influencer? It's, it's challenging in the sense that there's, there's very little help available. So we're kind of writing our own rule books at the moment. Um, and it's an unregulated industry for, for the most part. So there's brilliant examples and there's not so brilliant examples of people doing it. And the ASA guidelines are murky at best. Vague at best, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's, it's challenging, but that's also part of what makes it so exciting, I think, is that we're able to experiment and try things out and kind of establish our own rules. Yeah. Alice, you, how, how do you guys deal with that? Because obviously yeah. you're quite you're already in that space where you have these relationships yeah, with people. Yeah, exactly. I think that's where Social Pictures is in quite a fortunate position because, like you mentioned, we're part of a larger photographic agency that was established over six years ago that we deal with sort of above-the-line advertising, TV, billboards. So our bread and butter is getting a creative brief from an agency that's really specific, that they're used to controlling down to the, the shade of blue within an image and it's sort of the other end of the scale when you're working with influencers in the sense that you kind of have to trust <laughs> and you have to let them like we you know the whole point is that you're commissioning them to do their thing and, and be able to engage their audience in the way that they know how yeah. so we're, we're in a fortunate position of sort of being able to reconcile the two things of understanding what a clients looking for from you know a brief uh, with its all its specific demands but also being the voice of the artist, pushing back and finding that happy balance where something really amazing can be made. Yeah. So yeah, that's sort of what we do. <laughs> that's our, that's yeah. the challenge, it's yeah. What, it's what you're, you're doing day in and day out. Yeah. And Kate, how, how about from your perspective? Because I'm, I'm imagining as an artist, it's a completely different way in which you use your social channels. Your, you're using them to put your work out into the world rather than to make money from that content. Is this, is this all like a completely alien <coughs> thing, listening to us talking about ASA regulations and how you promote content versus don't promote content? It's not necessarily something that I think about, but it, I think things like being credited for work and things like that are actually really important because even though my work may be influential or good to some people, it's still important that people know that I've made it. And I yeah. think sometimes the sharing of content can be quite damaging. But my, what I was going to say is my follower count, for instance, I was told by one agency that I need to up my <coughs> follower count because that might make me more credible. And it was kind of, I don't think, for me, that's quite sad that that matters. That, that makes me feel a bit icky. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like that anyone would make that recommendation. Because I think, for me, I felt like I took a risk when I started making gifts because at the time, no one was, make, w w was really making them and I thought they were a real valid form of documentation of gigs and festivals and also as a form of portraiture. And now that it's actually brands are kind of picking up on that and seeing them as... Um, a valid way to connect with audiences, it's still something that could be taken, could be invested in more. And I think it is actually the perfect format for something like Instagram. It's kind of just sits so perfectly. Yeah. So that's, I guess that would be one thing that you, may, you wish maybe brands and agencies were a bit more aware of. What about other stuff that you really wish that the people asking you to do work for them were a bit more savvy about? I think appreciating the differences between influencer marketing <laughs> and conventional, especially print marketing. 
some brands are brilliant at it, some brands have really got it, but the majority of brands, I would say, are still not quite, it's still a, an education issue there, um, where maybe their objectives don't quite match up with what, what's going to be achieved, or just the way, that, that prescriptive way of working mm. that, you can, that you can expect if you're creating a print ad for a newspaper. Uh, if you're working with creators and you're not paying the rates for a stylist and a, yeah. and a photographer and a marketing executive and a visual stylist, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you're just paying one person, so you kind of need to to trust in them yeah. and trust their vision a bit more. Alice, yeah, I, I have quite a funny story in that I had a brief in for a wine brand. But, um, we've just done a, we just finished shooting for them, and um, the kind of budgets and the kind of the, the kind of project that it was was very influenced in the sense that. It was this artist going and shooting with his friends, um, you know, quite casual situations with the wine, you know, quite a spontaneous sort of shoot. Um, then we had a creative call with him and he was kind of like, so these are the ideas I have and, you know, they'll be making cookies and then, oh, they'll get some flour on the dog's nose. And I was like, what dog? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, with the shoot, you know, you have to sort of, there, there needs to be some understanding of production. You can't sort of just make things happen it's like as another example um i go into agencies and they're like oh we thought this influence would be amazing because they've shot loads of stuff like that before yeah. but the difference is they happen to be it might happen to be a beautiful day and you know things aligned so that they got this perfect shot because when you're commissioning work you have to create those environments often i mean you know to a certain extent you get lucky you choose locations that are going to look a certain way but you have to be able to deliver on a brief on a specific day and bring bring the production, yeah, with a stylist, with proper casting or whatever it may be. So, yeah, yeah just getting brands to kind of understand what's involved with making imagery. It, it's much more than you might think at mm. first. <laughs> Anything else that you wish brands were a bit more aware of? I think, I think they're, for me, I think they're aware that gifts are a really important part of what they're doing. And I just wish that they would kind of um, admit that in a way because sometimes I tend to feel like I'm tacked on to a shoot really? and and whereas actually I think what I'm doing has as much validity as print and film and I think especially as formats for social media what I'm doing I think connects much I've seen it in view counts for instance I did a, a shoot with a very famous octogenarian and she my gifts of her got so many more views and likes than a, a one minute film. Mm. So I, I admit it's kind of, I'm, I feel like I'm slightly ahead and there's kind of, and also brands can see that but they don't want to risk it because it's still kind of no print is where it's at or film is where it's at and I'm kind of going, no. <laughs> do, you, yeah. do you get a sense that they um, understand what they're asking of you when they do come and ask to work with you? No. <laughs> And is, do you think that's... Because um... I think they think that maybe I do it on an on a app or something, or yeah. where in actual fact things like um, cinemagraphs, because I make so many different types, so cinemagraphs, for instance, have to be fil filmed, so they're lit for film, and then there's post work, and then the same, my 3D stuff, which is really popular, is all shot on film. So there's actually it's quite a lot of process to it, and also process in how you shoot it to make sure it turns out the right way because I can't really edit. You know, I can't kind of have lots of rushes. Yeah. I mean, for instance, I was asked to do a shoot last week and they wanted really complicated cinemagraphs and I said, okay, that's, that's cool. And they, I said, how, what's the schedule like? And they said, oh, you'll have five minutes with the talent. I was kind of, that's just impossible. Wow. Okay. So there's... There, it, it sounds like all three of you are talking about better understanding of the actual process and the production. And it, it's thinking about why that might exist. There's probably a, a, a misinterpretation from a lot of brands, at least, that are working with influencers, that asking for content is just as simple as giving a brief and write, asking someone to write a, a tweet or something like that because there's this weird sense of perception mm. that all influencer marketing is the same. Mm. Does, that, does that resonate or is that just my understanding of it? That resonates very much. Um, and I suppose it's something I find a lot of creatives struggle with across industries, but definitely in the influencer field, which uh, Kate touched on. But 
that when you pay for a tweet or an Instagram post, mm -hmm. you're not just commissioning that single photo. You're not, that's not the value. The value is that audience that's taken years in most cases to build up and the relationship with the audience and the skills and the talent that go into being able to make a cinemagraph in a shorter time scale because you're experienced. And actually, in the same way that you wouldn't want just anyone off the street to perform brain surgery, yeah. you pay the premium. You need to be investing in good quality content creators, yeah. and that means paying for more than the 30 seconds it takes to write a tweet. Yeah. And do you get, um, sorry, we, did I just cut over you? Oh, no, no, not at all. So one thing you just touched on was um, uh, <coughs> payment, right? And uh, a, lot, a lot of the industry coverage, so the press of influencer marketing, is a handful of super, super famous influencers charging absolutely astronomical fees for a single mention in a video. Do you think that that has given more prominence to the world of influencers? Or do you think that it's giving the wrong impression to brands because um, it kind of gives a, a bit of a... It gives the wrong impression of how you might work with someone. Yeah, I think that's almost those kind of cases you talk about with the kind of crazy high following celebrity things. It's almost a different thing. It's a different market. It's a different animal because yeah. it's what you're, you know, what we work with and what we, we try, what we try and do here is match a brand to a creator where their audience is not just big. In fact, that, that can, you know, that's a number. It can... The, the client might say we want this many or this many, but it's the quality of that that audience. How relevant are those people that are following? Are they, you know, your followers? Are they mums who, if you've done something with Johnsons, that you know they're going to see that and go, oh, I might, I might actually buy that for myself. Whereas, just because they have so, so millions of followers doesn't mean, you know, it's it, almost the statistics can can be quite unuseful, sort of not useful mm. yeah. in really trying to value what's important here. Yeah. So it's, uh, it can be frustrating, yeah. Sure. And how, how much um, do you guys get asked to share things like uh, stats and numbers to try and help people prove the value of investment? That's probably mainly me. I, a fair amount, <coughs> I would say it was more common previously and it's less common now. I think because it's all there to be seen, really, if you know what you're looking for and you're doing your research. Um, and websites like Social Blade, places like that, where you can actually kind of really dig in depth and check out mm -hmm. that a following is authentic and is engaged on a long-term long scale. Yeah. And Kate, do you get asked at all? Because you, you mentioned um, looking at the kind of likes and engagement of certain pieces of content. Do you have people ask you for those kind of things when you work with them? Um, it has been put forward in pitches before. So, for instance, I was quite, I was an early on Giphy artist. Giphy is a New York based um, GIF hosting website. And um, now they actually um, track how many views your GIF, I don't know how they do it, but for instance, some of my GIFs have 26 million views, and you know, I didn't know until I'd seen that. So, that has been put forward but in the same way where I receive a deck a model's Instagram following number is on her account which I find quite strange but that's really important yeah. I've uh, recently just signed for a book but I was really astonished at how much following counts now for the publishing industry and mm -hmm. speaking to other creatives that really you, you're unlikely to get a publishing deal now without a following and publishers will say to you go away and, and build a social audience so it just seems to be across mm -hmm. all industries so let's talk about fake profiles. So um, there was some uh, research a couple of months ago that came out from an agency called Media Kicks who had set up some fake profiles, spent $500 um, on some stock photography and started and bought followers and started to build fake accounts to test whether they could get brands um, to pay them. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, within a space of about a month, they did actually end up making money from these mm. accounts. How, how does that make you guys feel? Because obviously that's a, a such contradiction to what you guys are doing and what you work really hard to do. And obviously, you know, they were doing that to, to prove a point. Um, but it, it is so easy to now fake that. How, how does that kind of sit with you? 
I think there's an extent to which, by the nature of it, that can happen. You can see why, why it might happen, because a lot of the way that these influences are found is through automated machines themselves. So all it is is it sees the number 500,000 followers, OK, then it's got through that tick, you know, and it, it, you can see how that might happen. But in the day-to-day -day of what I do, it would be impossible yeah. <laughs> for me to end up commissioning someone who, with a fake account. I mean, I guess that's one of the things that um, I sort of believe is quite good about social pictures as opposed to the majority of kind of influencer matching sites out there is that because we work on a more kind of artist level and we have conversations with the artists we use, we, you'd know immediately if they, if they weren't real, if they didn't know how to produce a shoot. Um, so we, yeah, we have the production know-how and we just would be able to see through it immediately. Um, so it sort, of, it sort of just would never come up in, in my day-to-day. -day. Um, yeah, and I guess from, from a commissioning perspective, that's quite true. But when you don't have the investment or the money to spend the time in working with yeah. someone one-on-one, -on -one, actually, and you're looking at, you know, again, you have that misperception of what influencer marketing is. It's quite easy to look at just numbers alone. Exactly. And I find it, inc that was me, sorry. <laughs> I find it incredibly disheartening. Do, do either of you guys have any, any takes on that? I, I, again, it comes down to brand education. I think if you understand what you're looking for, it doesn't take long. Five minutes and you can suss out a good profile from a bad profile, a, a strong influencer from a not so strong one. And also it's worth remembering that a big audience doesn't necessarily make an influencer. So I, and when I'm coaching people, I've, I've worked with people with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of followers who cannot convert that into a profitable business for themselves, mm -hmm. let alone for somebody else. Um, but equally, I've worked with people with much smaller audiences who are actually able to build, you only need a thousand followers to have yeah. a, a really lucrative account. So getting past this idea of it's about the numbers um, kind of removes the problem of the fake profiles and <laughs> helps to kind of get down to the, the really successful influencer marketing. Yeah. So Kate, do you, do, you, does, do you come across that at all in terms of more of a maker perspective? That doesn't really, no, that doesn't really affect me. I think what affects me is, where, because I suppose what I'm doing is um, quite fashionable now and, and it's uh, another thing that brands feel like they have to fulfill to, for their marketing purposes. So I've worked a really long time to hone my craft and um, get it to a, a strong level where I think it's really good and I can produce really strong content but I noticed that jobs that I turned down for instance we talked about which are I think not paying me a fair price for my work and the experience that I have I see people who pick who pick up the camera that I use and they pay them to do it but it doesn't look as good and I think it's a real shame because you get quality with that so there's a I, I experienced that quite a lot that's maybe fake in a way like yeah. people trying to copy what i do taking your style yeah and then trying to recreate it without yeah. actually crediting you that must be incredibly frustrating yeah, <laughs> yeah. so uh, let's open it up to the floor does anyone have any questions before i take up all of the time with these ladies any questions from the floor i know it's post lunch but <laughs> now you've got the light on you oh yeah there's one in the front here So just to repeat that for the guys at the back who can't hear that, what's the role of art in communications? 
a big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it sounds quite uh, generic, maybe, and quite philosophical and abstract, but art is, I guess, what inspires and captures people's attention. So any good advertising has some degree of artistry or craft in it. You, you wouldn't call it art, perhaps, by the nature of the fact that it's commercial. So it's, it, it's created as a means to an end, which is making money. So therefore, it's not art, but it's absolutely influenced by it because that's what humans find beautiful and interesting. So it's, it's always going to have an inherent part of advertising. I mean, yeah, that's a little bit abstract. <laughs> but um, I thought it was a great answer. That, that would be my answer, yeah. How about you? What do you think? Well, I actually have a fine, I have a fine art degree. And I think that's enabled me to um, think outside of you know, the limits of what you can do in advertising. Because as I said earlier, make something the same but different. So. Um, and I think, as I know that Ollie Byrne and your agency, he's done exhibitions, and I think being with an agency that supports your creative endeavours and ideas, you know, I've, I'm planning to have an exhibition next year, and I want it to have a mix of AR and um, VR and other Rs. And, yeah, so it's kind of, I think those, I think there's always going to be a strong place for art in advertising. Is that the right? Yeah. I think especially when I think I think the creators and makers I think are more interesting when they come from a different background because you have your own journey of how you've got there which no one else it makes you unique yeah. mm. and you make something because you want to rather than having yeah and I think it makes you then want to make as I was saying make content that isn't for advertising but actually full circle will influence advertising yeah Absolutely. To add on that, so in our Making Pictures, which is the parent agency which deals with photographers and directors for sort of above the line advertising, and so not the social space, but it sort of plays into that question is that we spend half the time encouraging them and in fact pestering them <laughs> to do personal work and basically do things like exhibitions and just, just go out and shoot personal work. So do a project on, um, you know, Ollie Byrne went to a place in America where there is apparently the most Mars-like conditions on Earth. So there's all these people preparing for what it's going to be like on Mars. It's mad, anyway. <laughs> um, he just did a personal project there, and then he did an exhibition. And that's what feeds their commercial careers. They wouldn't be commercial photographers without that. So it's almost an absolutely necessary part. Um, yeah. yeah. How about you? I, Maybe it's my naivety and my understanding of how advertising traditionally works, but it feels to me like we are seeing um, a simplification of the process and maybe instead of it all being corporate-based, that by reaching out to creators and artists like the people who are making pictures or social pictures, that people who are still in the arena of art, still making art on a day-to-day -day basis, are now being involved in promotional work and advertising as well rather than people who that's their whole role mm. and that's their whole focus, which is going to lead to more mixing and m better communication. Yeah. And I think one of the... When people always ask where is the influencer industry heading, it is towards that. It is towards co proper co-creation, where you find a, a partner where there are shared values. It's not just about briefing someone to do something, um, which is a frustration on all sides, I think, but it's properly finding out where you can find that magic yeah. with someone else and working out how you can help one another rather than yeah, just telling absolutely. someone what to do. Mm. It's so, I mean, and it's so nice when that happens because, yeah. for instance, last week we just did a, a job with an uh, organic cider brand and they, did, they put on an event that was sort of like a harvest day, so they were taking a group through. They were showing them how the cider's made. They had a soil association talk and had a lunch and everything. And I brought two influencers to the table who are very nature-based and that's sort of their interest. And they just had the best day. And they kind of emailed me. They, they had to deliver. So the brand were getting something because they were getting a post and some Instagram stories and things like that. They just both emailed me like, thank you so much. That was the best day, you know. And it's so nice when that happens because it is, we're so tired of the words like authentic <laughs> and yeah. organic, but it, but it was just really genuine, yeah. so. And probably plays into something that Sir Martin said in the keynote from this morning, which is about looking at how to build longer term mm -hmm. approaches. And I, I think that has to be true from an influencer point of view, because it's not about the short kind of transactional mm. 
way of working anymore, which unfortunately influencer marketing used to be very much, can mm. you write a blog about this product? Now it's, what can we build together? Mm. Somebody told me a story just last week actually about an American company that sells eyelashes. And they were previously doing celebrity, like kind of Z-list celebrity endorsements. Um, but he noticed, the, the owner of this business noticed that a lot of young girls on YouTube were using his eyelashes. So he dropped the celebrity endorsement and went to them instead. Didn't pay them anything, but gave them commissions on sales um, so that they would include an affiliate link. Mm -hmm. And he's just sold the business for something like $10 million, $10 million made it massively profitable, and that was the only, the only source of advertising. But because it was mutually beneficial, so they got mm -hmm. a percentage of the sales, yeah. It was something they were already talking about. It was genuine, it was organic, and, and that was a long-term relationship. And I think that's the model we need to be moving towards. Yeah, completely agree. Any other questions from the floor? Yeah, one on the right here. Uh, <coughs> thank you for this, it's very interesting. Um, if you become like a person or becomes the brand, you are what you are, um, do you have any advice on how you manage to keep some sanity in all that? <laughs> Gosh, you're probably the best person to answer that as the sort of yeah, creator who... Yeah, I suppose who so. Uh, sanity, maybe not my specialty. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think the thing is as well, when, when you put yourself out online, it's obviously a version of yourself. It's your professional version of yourself. And although a lot of what I share is my personal life and authenticity, I mean, it's a buzzword, but it means an awful lot to a lot of people. Um, but it's still only a percentage of my everyday life. You see less than 1% of my daily life online. So there's plenty that you do and can hold back for yourself. And there are versions of me that only my husband gets to see or only my daughter gets to see, um, just as there are versions of me that will only show up on Twitter or elsewhere. Uh, it's, it's a new way of working, and, and it's definitely something that's tricky to navigate. But lately, I've been talking to quite a lot of um, quite high-profile columnists about it, because it's actually not that dissimilar to people who share their personal life maybe in, you know, in, in one of the big broadsheets every week. Um, they have a certain level of notoriety and people feel like they know them, but actually when you speak to them, there's so much more that they hold back for themselves. Cool. Okay. Any tips on keeping sane while making digital content? <laughs> <laughs> Don't check other people who make it. No, um, I actually think that's a really good yeah. advice, actually. It's been really nice to connect with other makers actually even people that I've never met in the states for instance there's one particular artist called Sam Cannon who's amazing and we talked we connected via Tumblr years ago and we still talk now and hopefully I'll be going to New York um, soon and we're going to meet and it that's been really nice to kind of get advice before having an agent and then also talking about because she was doing really well before I was, and it's, yeah, that side of things has been really great and very supportive, surprisingly. And I, I talk to people all the time that I don't know. Which is great, because yeah. then you feel like part of a community. Yeah. yeah, that's another thing, the sort of collabor collaboration between artists is sort of a whole new area that social media opens up that probably didn't quite exist or not in the same way before, because you can literally be anywhere in the world and find someone who you get creatively on whatever level and can make something happen and it happens all the time um, which probably didn't happen before yeah. or, you know but I so. always say Instagram is the only platform where you connect with someone aesthetically before anything else exactly yeah. so you land on someone's page and you decide whether or not you connect with them based on yeah. what you see visually and, and that can build really powerful relationships mm. yeah. Amazing. So let's leave it there. Thank you very much, all three of you. Very lovely to have you on the panel, if I can have a round of applause for the ladies.